Hello everyone and welcome back to this series on the STM32G4 and real-time signal processing. In the previous video we looked at the analog to digital converter and I walked through a few demos on how to use it. Now, in the first big milestone of this series, this video will give a brief intro to the digital to analog converter and demonstrate how to pair the ADC and DAC together with DMA. Additionally, I'll show some basic DSP operations such as multiplication, addition, and implementing time delays. So before we tie the ADC and DAC together, let's take a quick look at the DAC. So unlike the ADC on the STM32G4, the DAC is significantly less complicated. Depending on the chip, there's up to four DAC units, each supporting just two channels. DAC units 1 and 2 support external channels, and DAC units 3 and 4 support internal channels. Simply put, the external channels are just connected to GPIO pins and drive signals off the chip, while the internal channels must be fed to on-chip peripherals like the comparators or the op-amps. And unlike the ADC, which is connected to almost every pin on the chip, the DAC only connects to a maximum of three GPIO pins, PA4, PA5, and PA6. Lastly, unlike the 4 MHz speeds of the ADC, the DAC is slower and maxes out at 1 MHz. In any basic signal processing system, analog data is sampled and converted to discrete integer values using an analog to digital converter, or ADC. These sampled values are then processed in software, where any number of different signal processing operations may be used. After processing, the data is fed into the digital to analog converter, or DAC which converts the discretized data back into a continuous analog voltage. For this example, the output data from the ADC will be sent directly to the DAC without alteration. This is a loopback system. Our primary focus will be on the setup required to run the ADC and DAC together, rather than any DSP for now. Um, specifically, we will have to use direct memory access to handle the data transfer to and from the converters and timers to control the sampling rate and trigger both converters at the same interval. In short, Direct Memory Access, or DMA, is a piece of hardware that will automatically transfer data from peripherals to memory and vice versa. Therefore, DMA will be used to transfer data from the ADC to memory and from memory to the DAC. Within our code, we will create two buffers, one for the ADC and one for the DAC. We will then instruct the DMA controller to write and read from these buffers respectively. We will also create code to read the data in the ADC buffer and place it within the DAC buffer. Traditionally, this piece of code is where we would place our signal processing operations. However, for this loopback example, the data is transferred between buffers without manipulation. Finally, both of the converter's sample rates and buffer lengths must be identical. Thus, the indices being accessed in the ADC and DAC buffers by the DMA controller will be identical, which we will see shortly is critical for moving the data between the two. Unfortunately, DMA is a little more complicated than that. Specifically, we have to know when to move the data between the buffers. If we move the data too early, we risk overwriting data within the DAC buffer that has yet to be sent to the DAC. If we move the data too late, the DAC buffer will be empty and become forced to repeat previously sampled data. This is where the callback functions come into play. Specifically, there are two callbacks for DMA, the conversion half-complete callback and the conversion complete callback. These functions will run automatically just like interrupts when their criteria is met. It is within these functions that we will move the data over, half a buffer each time. The half complete callback will be triggered when the DMA controller transitions from filling the first half of the ADC buffer to the second half. In this example, if we use a buffer length of 5000, the half complete callback is triggered when the DMA controller moves from filling index 2499 of the ADC buffer to index 2500. When the half-complete callback runs, we know two things about the system. Firstly, the first half of the ADC buffer has just been filled with fresh data. This means that the DMA controller is now sending data to the second half of the ADC buffer. Secondly, since the indices being accessed within the two buffers are the same, all of the data within the first half of the DAC buffer has been sent to the DAC. Likewise, the DMA controller is now reading from the second half of the DAC buffer. Therefore, when the half-complete callback runs, we know it is safe to move the freshly sampled data within the first half of the ADC buffer to the first half of the DAC buffer. Of course, this is only true because the sample rates and buffer sizes of the two converters are equal, so keep that in mind. Similar to the half-complete callback, the complete callback is triggered when the DMA controller completely fills the second half of the ADC buffer and circles back to the start. 
For this example, the complete callback is triggered when the DMA controller moves from indices 49.99 to 0. Now, when the second half of the ADC buffer has been filled, the conversion complete callback runs. Just like the half complete callback, the conversion complete callback tells us two things about the system. Firstly, the second half of the ADC buffer has just been filled with fresh ADC data, which means that the DMA controller has wrapped around to the start of the ADC buffer and is now at index 0. Secondly, all of the data within the second half of the DAC buffer has been sent to the DAC, and the DMA controller is now reading from the first half of the DAC buffer. Therefore, when the complete callback runs, we know it is safe to transfer data from the second half of the ADC buffer to the second half of the DAC buffer. Now that I've given a brief introduction to DMA, we can start configuring the hardware for our loopback system. As previously mentioned, to drive both the ADC and DAC together at the exact same sample rate, we will make use of timers. Like the previous video, both converters will be configured to tr trigger when the timer counting period elapses. Therefore, by tuning the value of the prescaler and auto reload register, we can specify an exact sample rate. For this example, I will drive both the ADC and DAC at 1 MHz. I will accomplish this by using timer 7, setting the prescaler to 16, and the auto reload register or counter period to 9. Therefore, the counter will reset every microsecond, providing our 1 MHz trigger. As a reminder, the values entered for the prescaler and auto reload register are incremented by 1 in the cube IDE. So, while technically we want a prescaler of 17 and an auto reload register of 10, we instead use the values of 16 and 9. For readability, I'll leave the numbers as the difference between our desired value and 1. Lastly, the final hardware decision to make is to choose a pin or channel for the ADC and DAC. For the ADC, I will use pin PC3, which corresponds to ADC1 channel 9. For the DAC, I will choose pin PA4, which corresponds to DAC1 channel 1. I chose this ADC pin mostly because I'm lazy and I can easily grab it with my oscilloscope probe without a jumper wire. The DAC pin, on the other hand, has only two options on my G491 board, PA4 and PA5. Since PA5 is already connected to the onboard LED, I'll choose PA4. Since the ADC will be timer triggered and use DMA, the following must be set within the cube IDE. First, ADC1 channel 9 must be enabled. Next, ADC1 has to be added to DMA with the mode set to circular and the memory data width set to word. Lastly, DMA continuous requests must be enabled, and the external trigger conversion source must be set to the timer 7 trigger out event. Just like the ADC, the DAC must first be enabled and set as connected to external pin PA4. Next, the DAC must be added to DMA with the mode set to circular, and unlike the ADC, both the peripheral and memory data width must be set to word. Lastly, the output buffer should be enabled and the trigger set to timer 7 trigger out event. Finally, timer 7 must be configured. Again, to create the 1 MHz sample rate, I'll set the prescaler to 16 and the period to 9. And, to trigger the converters, the trigger event selection must be set to update event. The code for this example requires us to create two buffers, one to feed into the ADC initialization function and one for the DAC. It is through passing the buffers into these functions that they become linked to the DMA controller. Additionally, the length of the buffers must also be passed into the initialization functions. On top of that, in the case of the DAC, the channel also must be specified, channel 1 for pin PA4, as well as the bit count and alignment, 12 bits red aligned. Finally, we will call the time base start function to begin counting on timer 7. Lastly, we must write the function declarations for the two callbacks and include the code to transfer data between the buffers. For our loopback example, two for loops will be used. First, within the half-complete callback, a for loop will iterate through the first half of the ADC buffer, indices 0 to half n, and store these values in the DAC buffer. Likewise, within the complete callback, a for loop will iterate through the second half of the ADC buffer, indices half n to n, and store these values in the DAC buffer. Okay, with the prerequisite information covered, I will now open the cube IDE, create a new project, and initialize all the peripherals within their default mode.
Starting within the hardware configuration perspective, first I will activate ADC1 and set N9 to single-ended. Next, within the DMA settings, I will add ADC1, set the mode to circular, and the memory data width to Word. Now, under the parameter settings, I will enable DMA continuous requests and set the external trigger conversion source to timer 7 trigger out event. Next, I will activate the DAC and set out 1 to connect to the external pin. Now, under the DMA settings, I will add DAC1 channel 1, set the mode to circular, and specify both the peripheral and memory data width as Word. Back under the parameter settings, I will now specify the trigger as timer 7 trigger out event. Lastly, I will now activate timer 7. I will set the prescaler to 16 and the period to 9. Finally, I will set the trigger event selection to update event. Now, I will save, generate code, and switch to the C perspective. Starting from the top of the freshly created main.c file, I will first define the buffer size within the private definition section. For this example, I'm going to use a buffer size of 5,000 samples. Next, within the private variable section, I will create the ADC and DAC buffers with size n. Now, within the user code 2 section, I will place the code to start the ADC, DAC, and timer 7. Finally, at the bottom of the file within the user code 4 section, I will place the two callback functions. Now with the basic script complete, I will do a few things. First, I will compile the code and program the board. Now, with the code running, I will turn on my oscilloscope and navigate to it in my browser. On my oscilloscope, I have two inputs enabled. The output directly from the function generator, in purple, and the output from the STM, in yellow. On the function generator, I will now configure the output as a 1 kHz sine wave, with 2 volts peak to peak and a 1.5 volt DC offset. Therefore, the sine wave will oscillate between 0.5 and 2.5 volts, which is close to the center of the ADC conversion range. Now, with the function generator running, the output of the STM32 can be observed in yellow. As we can see, there is no noticeable difference between the output of the function generator and the output of the STM32. However, there is a large delay in time that we are unable to see with this waveform. Specifically, since the buffer is 5,000 samples long, with each sample lasting one microsecond, there is a 5 millisecond time delay on the output. 
To demonstrate this delay, I will now set the output waveform as a pulse with frequency of 10 Hz and a duty cycle of 10%. With this configuration, we can now clearly observe the delayed signal generated from the STM32. As shown in the bottom right, we can measure 5 milliseconds as the delay, which is exactly what we should expect. Now that we have a loopback system running, let's start adding some basic signal processing to the system. Potentially the easiest operation to implement is that of multiplication, where the output of the system is obtained by linearly scaling the amplitude of the input. This can be implemented rather easily by multiplying the ADC data by a scalar as it is being stored in the DAC buffer. For this example, I will divide the signal by 2. As a demonstration, back within the cube IDE, I will add the divide by 2 operation to both of the for loops. With the code added, I will now reprogram the board and return to the oscilloscope. Now, by feeding in a 100Hz sine wave, the effects of dividing the input signal by 2 can clearly be observed. As we can see, the amplitude of the signal has been cut in half. Additionally, so has the DC offset that the input signal was centered on. Uh, depending on the application, the manipulation of this DC offset may be important. Therefore, the next example will cover addition, with a focus on restoring the DC offset of our divide by 2 system back to that of the input. Like multiplication, all that's necessary for implementation is a simple edit to the for loop. However, unlike multiplication, which scales easily regardless of data type, knowing exactly how much to add or subtract is not trivial. Therefore, the primary goal of this example is to not just give a demonstration of addition, but to illustrate how data changes throughout the signal chain. Thus far, we have looked at an offset sine wave as the input to the STM. Specifically, the wave with an amplitude of 1 and a DC offset of 1.5 can be represented by the formula on screen. As the signal is fed into the STM and sampled by the ADC, it is digitized. Uh, we can represent this digitization by multiplying the input signal by 4095 over 3.3. This scalar comes from the fact that the ADC is operating with 12 bits over a corresponding 3.3 volt conversion range. As we saw in the multiplication demo, we used a divide by 2. Therefore, to model the multiplication system, we can represent the DAC value as the ADC value multiplied by 1 half. Finally, the DAC value is converted back to an analog voltage. This conversion can be mathematically represented as the inverse of digitization. Uh, specifically, the DAC value is multiplied by 3.3 and divided by 4095. Therefore, the analog output signal can be represented as the input signal scaled by 1 half. For example purposes, I'll show how to use addition to adjust the DC offset of the signal. In its current configuration, the system divides both the amplitude of the sine wave and the DC offset by 2. Therefore, addition will be used to return the DC offset of the output signal back to that of the input. To do this, we need to find the integer value corresponding to our DC offset. To find this value, First, we will calculate the difference between the DC offsets in the input and the output. This can be done by multiplying the offset of the input signal by the scalar, or simply observing the difference of the input and output signals, as is done here. Next, this value will be scaled by the ADC conversion factor, converting the analog voltage difference to an integer value. Finally, we can add this constant to the DSP system. If we now work out the math for the output signal, we can see that the DC offset between the input and output now remains unchanged while the amplitude of the sine wave components have been halved. Now, within the for loop, we can add the DC constant that was calculated. I will now, once again, return back to the IDE and make this change. Then, I will pull up the oscilloscope and we can take a look. Now, by modifying the program to add this constant, 
we can confirm that the DC offset between the input and output signal remains unchanged. However, the amplitude of the sine wave has been reduced from 2 volts peak to peak to 1. Lastly, the final topic of this video is the implementation of time delays, where the output signal is delayed by a specific time increment, or in this case, the signal is shifted back in time by an integer number of samples. And, since the sample rate of the system is one mega sample per second, each shift corresponds to a one microsecond time delay. In its simplest form, a delay is just a shift that occurs when we move data from the ADC buffer to the DAC buffer. For this example, I will walk through the implementation of a delay by two, and then abstract this to generalize any delay. The simplest way to implement the delay is to increment the DAC buffer index by two while we write the data from the ADC. However, this solution, as nice as it is, is not complete. As an example, consider the delay by two case when both buffers are of length 10. When the half complete callback runs, data in ADC buffer indices 0 through 4 is now shifted by 2 and stored into DAC buffer indices 2 through 6. This is okay for the first three values. However, as the callback has just begun to run, the DMA controller will currently be in the process of writing and reading from index 5 of the ADC and DAC buffers respectively. Therefore, as we write the values in indices 3 and 4 of the ADC buffer to indices 5 and 6 of the DAC buffer, we overwrite data that has yet to be sent to the DAC. Likewise, when the complete callback is triggered, the ADC is now filling the first index of the ADC buffer, and the DAC is now reading from the first index of the DAC buffer. If we were to now assign indices 8 and 9 of the ADC buffer to indices 0 and 1 of the DAC buffer, we again will overwrite the data prior to it being sent to the DAC. Therefore, to ensure that the data within the DAC buffer is not overwritten, two variables temp1 and temp2 will be introduced. When the half-complete callback runs and the DMA controller is operating on the second half of both buffers, we will fill the first two indices of the DAC buffer with the value stored in temp2. Next, like in the trivial case, I will fill DAC buffer indices 2 through 4 with the data contained in ADC buffer indices 0 through 2. Lastly, instead of writing indices 3 and 4 of the ADC buffer to indices 5 and 6 of the DAC buffer, the data will be stored in the variable temp1 for use when the conversion complete callback runs. Now, when the conversion complete callback runs and the DMA controller is operating on the first half of both buffers, I will fill indices 5 and 6 of the DAC buffer with the data stored in temp1. Then, I will fill DAC buffer indices 7 through 9 with the data contained in ADC buffer indices 5 through 7. Lastly, instead of writing indices 8 and 9 of the ADC buffer to indices 0 and 1 of the DAC buffer, I will store it in the variable temp2 to be used when the conversion half complete callback runs. Therefore, there are a total of three for loops used during the half complete callback. The first moves the values from the temp2 variable to the DAC buffer. The second shifts the ADC buffer and stores it in the DAC buffer and the third stores the N2 values of the ADC buffer in the temp1 variable. Again, we can use three for loops for the complete callback. The first writes the value within the temp1 variable to indices 5 and 6 of the DAC buffer. The second shifts the ADC buffer by 2 and stores it in the DAC buffer. And the third stores the N2 values of the ADC buffer in the temp2 variable. Finally, this code can be generalized for any delay on any sized buffer. Back within the cube IDE, I will add the variable for delay and the two temporary variables. Then I'll add the code for the for loops. Next, I'll build the code and reprogram the board. Additionally, I'll modify the waveform on the function generator to a pulse rather than a sine wave. This will allow for easier measurements of the time delays.
If I now set the delay to implement a shift of 500, or a delay of 500 microseconds, we can now observe that the signal on the oscilloscope is shifted back in time by about 5.50 milliseconds, exactly what we would expect. Now, if I set the delay to 1500 samples, or 1 1.5 milliseconds, we can see that the delay between the input and output is about 6.5 milliseconds, again, exactly what we would expect. The 5 millisecond base delay because of our 5000 sample buffer, and the 1.5 second delay, 1.5 millisecond delay added on top of it. And that's it. Thanks so much for watching. Stay tuned for the next video where I will introduce the ARM CMSYS DSP libraries so we can begin adding some real DSP capabilities to the system. Thank you.